Hello, welcome back. This is Silent Song and Other Stories. This time around with me here is a ghost analysis, which is done by Chimamanda Gozi Adichie. It's one of the short stories in this collection of Silent Song and Other Stories. But of course, done by one of my favorites, of, of favorite writer, of course, from Africa. She goes by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Adichie, uh, the reason why she's one of my favorite is that uh, she has not only featured here in this particular curriculum, she has also featured in the British curriculum, English Language A, where she has done, uh, where there is a consideration of one of her works, and that is a speech that she gave at a TED mm -hmm. conference. And then she talks of uh, how people form single-mindedness or how people form prejudiced ideas uh, as a result of the things that they hang around too much again and again, just like you can tell kids stories again and again. Now here she is, and she is now also, uh, her work is also featured, has also featured in this particular curriculum, that is short stories, uh, silent songs and other stories, and we're going to see what does she have to tell us here, or what does she have to share here. Above all, her major focus, Chimamanda, has always been feminism. Okay, feminism, quote in quotes, it doesn't mean exactly uh, gender biased, but <coughs> those kind of writers are feminist writer. Those kind of writers who write or influenced by the things that they uh, they come across uh, instantly, or the things that they surround, they write as a result of the things that they interact with immediately around them. So she's one of those particular writers that we can quote in quote refer as the feminist writers. And get it straight, I am not talking about feminism as far as gender bias or gender maybe implications are concerned. I'm talking about uh, writers who are strongly biased or maybe prejudiced. Their content or their work is basically based or based uh, maybe uh, uh, based on the things that happen around them. So without that much of much further ado, and of course, of course, before we get into that much further ado, how about a subscription or a thumbs up and a sharing with good friends. And you guys, you've been a motivation. In fact, from the few couple of sentiments that I've gotten on the comment section there, kudos, kudos, man. And uh, yeah, yeah, I've gotten your sentiments and I'm going to look at those particular chapter analysis, chapter chapter 10 11 12 no no no. it is from chapter 12 11 12 13 and 14 of the fathers of nations i haven't forgotten and if you, at this particular moment you happen that you, you're listening to these words be assured that consider it done and i'm putting everything in place so that we have the whole package even as we're getting into these uncharted waters therefore let's dive into these ghost analysis from a silent song and other stories by adichie <clears throat> uh, Shimamanda Adichie's story, that is Ghost, revolves around the protagonist James Noye, a 71-year-old retired mathematics, mathematics professor. And uh, Noye lives over pension, although he does not receive it when he should. The story explores how memories of the past can haunt us in the present. The tale, aptly named Ghost, opens when Noye meets his former colleague Ekena Okoro, whom he thought, uh, whom he thought rather had died in the Biafran War. His first thought is to throw sand at him. His people's traditions practices to ascertain that a person is not a ghost. He restrains himself since he is a Western educated man, or so we think. So who are the characters in ghosts? First of all, the, 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 the people, the characters that these particular events uh, maybe are projected around. We have James Noye, retired professor. We have Eberi, that is James' late wife. Zeke, James' late daughter. Giru, James' daughter, who is a doctor. Ekena Okoro, James' former colleague. Vincent, James' former driver. Chuck Bell, James' American friend. Josephat Odena, that is an inept vice chancellor. Ngusa University. Then also we have Harrison, James Gardiner, Dr. O uh, Otgabu, Professor Ijere, James' next door neighbor, and also Professor Madue, James' friend, without forgetting Professor Ezike and Dr. Anya. Those are the characters that are going to 
uh, to circulate or to populate the maybe project on ideas who, uh, which are going to uh, maybe be projected around these particular characters. <coughs> Sorry, now let's quickly look at the survey or the summary. A summary is not an analysis, good learners. A summary can be seen as a, 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 a paraphrased work, not an analyzed work. Analysis has to do with some bit of understanding, some bit of interpretation, a bit of uh, evaluation, and a bit of putting together your conclusions and come up with uh, maybe a created work. But summary, it is specifically trying to paraphrase or putting that work in your own words, but may keeping the main message. So the professor is in the university to collect his pension yet again. The pension money is mismanaged or stolen. Some people claim that, that the pension money was stolen by the education minister. Another avers that the vice chancellor deposited the money in high interest personal accounts. Since ordinary Nigerians cannot access pension, many of them are poverty stricken. The former university staff drivers and messengers are tattered and hungry. They have not received pension for three years. Vincent, that is professor's former driver, avers that, and we quote, this is why people retire and die. That's found on page 58. Adichie uses Vincent to shine light on the plight of poor retirees of the university. The former driver is now a cobbler who mends students' shoes, but they never pay him on time. He also complains about Nigeria being an ungrateful country. His skin is so wrinkled that he appears older than Noe, who is older than him. The other workers, who are also there to collect their elusive pension, decry the poor state of affairs. Carpentry is not going well. The children are ill and they have money lender problems. They love as they talk as if to conceal their resentment. Noe sympathizes with them. Luckily, for him, he has some savings and receives some dollars from, in this particular case, uh, uh, for some dollars from his daughter Giru, who is a doctor in America. The men's ashy hands and faces remind him of how a bearer his late wife used to rub lotion on his body. This fond memory is a statement of their once affectionate bond. Noe is shocked to meet Ekena Okoro, a man that he, he thought died 37 years ago. It is as if he had seen a ghost. Although Ekena Okoro and Noe were not friends, everyone knew that Ekena Okoro. He was an eccentric dissident uh, who never shied away from speaking his mind. <coughs> he petitioned the government about better conditions for the non-academic staff. Other lecturers admired his edgy fearlessness, however, he now seems a pale shadow of his former brush self. Noe can pick up unusual dividends, lack of confidence rather, about Okena Ikena Okoro. Noe believes that Ikena Okoro died on July 6th, 1967, the day they were evacuated or evacuated from Mzuka. Their enemy, the federal soldiers, was advancing but the militia assured them of victory in a matter of days. Noye believed that the vandals, those of the federal soldiers, would be defeated in a week or two. As the professor flees in his impala, he observes the villagers fleeing on foot, women with boxes on their heads and babies on their backs, hurry away. The men push bicycles and carry arms. They would later return to the mystery of having to pick through the lecturers' dustbins after the war. <coughs> Good. Now, Noye sports a kena. And uh, in this case, what we have is, uh, what is that? Sorry for that. Um, Noye sports Ekena uh, Okoro driving back into campus. He tries to dissuade him, but Ekena Okoro is a headstrong renegade. When Izuka is captured by the Vedra soldiers, two lecturers are killed. Noye assumes that one of, the, one of them was Ekena Okoro. Noye is disappointed to learn that Ekena Okoro fled to Sweden Sweden rather on a red cross plane instead of staying to support the Biafran cause. He is angry at the saboteurs who betrayed the Biafran cause, which he supports dearly. Since his entire family was wiped out when a bomb was dropped in Ornu, 
Ekena Okoro chose to stay in Sweden since he had no reason to come back. He claims that while there, he organized beer from rallies and found brazing. The war had a devastating aftermath. When a baron Moy returned to Nzuka in 1970, that is three years after they had left, they are dismayed by the amount of destruction that they find. Their books are charred, piled under the umbrella to the tree, lump of calcified feces in the bathtub. Pages of books used as toilet papers. A various piano missing, Moyer's graduation gown used to wipe something and crawling with ants, and their photos ripped and framed, destroyed. Devastated, they decide to leave to for America, and they do not return until 1976, that is six years later again. <coughs> While there in America, his American friend Chuck Bells helps him secure a teaching appointment. When they return, they are assigned a new house, but they are disheartened when the umbrella tree and their old house is cut down by the new occupant. Sadly, we learn that Moyer's daughter, Zeke, perished in the war. Another victim of the war is Chris Okigbo, a poetry colossus that Noye refers to as our genius, our star. He took up a gun to defend Zuka. Noye regrets when he says that at least he was brave enough to fight. He feels like it sounded like a jeep meant to deride Ekena Koro who fled when the war began. Out of discomfort, Noe decides to tell Ekena Koro about the day Ebere and he drove back to Zuka and witnessed the destructive aftermath of the war. Landscape of ruins blown out of roofs, houses riddled with bullet holes and the wounded soldiers who were shoved who was shot rather into their car, bleeding profusely. Noye tries to cheer up Ekena Koro by saying that the metallic smell of the soldier's blood reminded him of Ekena. This was a lie. Ekena Koro sheds tears when he learns that Ebere died three years ago. Noye tells him that she visits him as an apparition, but he dismisses it by simply saying, quipping, I see. Ekena Koro perceives belief in ghosts as madness because of his education. Noye clearly misses his wife and the physical aspect of their relationship. He reminisces, rather, about how his wife would rub lotion into his skin. This is a testament of how they had a strong, intimate relationship when she was alive. He keeps her alive in his imagination by imagining that she visits him as a ghost. He is reluctant to tell his daughter about the mother's visits lest she drags him back with her to America. The war and laws denies Noye the opportunity of teaching his grandson his language and simple courtesies like greeting strangers. The grandson lives in America with his mother. The family is broken as a result of war. The two acquaintances then talk about the university staff club. The club is a shell of what it used to be. The novices are incompetent. There is no teaching going on. They are only concerned about university politics. The students buy grades with money on their bodies or their bodies. The Senate meetings have de degenerated into personality cult battles. Ikena Okoro and Noye recall memories of Josephat Odena, who was once the best ballroom dancer. He has been a vice chancellor for six years and has run the university like a chicken coop. He stole university money and bought himself new cars. Court cases challenging his misappropriation did not bear fruits. <clears throat> Josephat runs the university as a, a one-man show and dedicates the promotion of or stagnation of the university staff. The vice chancellor who replaces him is not any different. The inefficiency in the university is so rife that Noye and many others have not received any pension long after they retired. No one speaks against the widespread corruption and inaction. Ironically, even the lecturers rather bribe someone to change their dates of birth in order to work for five more years. No one wants to retire. The corruption and inefficiency is experienced all over the country. The professor shakes his head resignedly, as if to say that the situation is sadly ineluctable. The latest plague in the country is fake drugs. People sell expired medicine. Ebere died because of ineffective medication. She was getting weaker and weaker instead of recovering from the medication. Noe was distraught. He says gravely that fake drugs are horrible. 
<coughs> no one spends his retirement days visiting an old friend, taking leisurely walks, reading newspapers, talking to their daughter, reading old journals, and watching birds from his veranda. From his admission, we learn that the roads have buffles, motorcades are ridden recklessly, and you have to bribe someone to at Nittel just to have your phone repaired. Since the berry started visiting, James stopped going to church since he claims that he is no longer uncertain of an afterlife. As they part ways, Noye invites Ekena Okoro who ascends, but he knows he will not come. Noye has more fond memories of Ebere as he remembers how she used to mock other people's Mercedes. He says that she still has a sense of humor even as a ghost. While watching TV, he sees a man that admits selling fake typhoid fever medicine that doesn't kill people but does not cure the illness either. The only consolation for Noe is that Ebere visits him. It turns out that nobody talks about the war but the harrowing memories keep lingering like a ghost. James recalls horrors like crouching in muddy bunkers during air raids, barring corpses, hitting cassava peel and helplessly watching their children battling malnutrition. As Noe sits in his study, he waits for a call from his daughter, Nkiru, or a visit from the ghost of his late wife, Ebere. Now, the destructive aftermath of the war in Ghost by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie is the displacement of families. There's death, Zeke, two lecturers, Chris Okigbo, Ekena entirely his family, destruction of property, landscape with ruins, blown out roofs, houses with holes, there's trauma, wounded soldiers, Ekena, Okoro, pale shadow of his former self, separation of families, Ngiru and his son live in America, harrowing conditions, muddy bunkers, no food, cassava pills, malnutrition, relief, food, picking through dust bins. And good learners, good learners, that has been so quick. And I just want to apologize even in case maybe you didn't follow through. But the good thing is that this work is already there. You might as well as want to go back to the previous episode, I mean previous slides, pause where you think that you need to chop down the important key aspects of this particular short story. And above all, I just want to say that because this is, is, is one of also the longest uh, short stories in this particular series on another stories in the collection, you'd need maybe to have read it and then pay attention to give it more times before you start looking at the summary even as I'm looking forward to give you the essays or essay responses to questions or possible questions or exam style, exam style prompts and of course there are sample responses. It's a good thing to know that you're following through and I'm very very much proud of you guys by your support, by commenting down there and for those that have just come through by their support, I know we are getting big, we're growing. And how I wish that you are not left out, you are not, not left behind. You never know where maybe the crack is going to strike. I told you that it's a platform that you're going to have not only English literature, you're going to have other sessions along. So how about that you start maybe making your seat at the round table. When that particular meeting comes, you are counted as one of the beneficiaries so that we can maybe use this particular as a platform, as an umbrella that can usher our dreams or can usher us into another uh, level of our maybe doing things and development. Above all, cheers guys and I need you to uh, stay there. Uh, in, the, in our next episode, we're also going to look at another short story because we need really to wind it up. Uh, <coughs> and that is God sees. Um, there's something that God sees the truth, but he waits. And we're going to be looking shortly at that particular analysis before we maybe look at now essays from each of the short stories and their sample responses. Good day. <laughs>